this planet is in dire straits. We know that global climate is a real issue. We know that it's a super problem that needs to be solved, and we have to face up to that. The Wrigley Institute is a great place to do that. We're just ideally located to solve certain kinds of problems that deal with sustainability. And if we're going to be taken seriously, we have to lead by example. We hope that within 10 years, we will be a completely sustainable institute. Once we're there, everybody will want access to the knowledge of how we did it. And we can move this technology to the land, to other cities, to other countries. And I can't think of a more laudable goal. We do a lot of different kinds of research here. We do a lot of basic research looking at uh, how the ocean works, how organisms survive, what they're doing in the ocean, a lot of things, uh, say, on the nitrogen cycle, marine pollutants. And we do applied research, uh, things like uh, understanding uh, how kelp grow and trying to develop uh, programs for marine food and for biofuels. And we do very applied research on uh, how to get rid of waste of various kinds. So there's a whole wide range of things we do here. At the ocean floor, we have a very interdisciplinary research of microbiology, biology, geochemistry, sedimentology, and so forth. So we need to study them to actually find out what uh, impact changes have, changes in temperature, uh, input of nutrients and so forth. So we're talking here about the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, so global element cycles that take place in the ocean floor. And because we have to do a lot of our experiments right after we, for example, take samples or we do in situ measurements, the closeness to the Wrigley Institute is really important. My primary blue water research is on uh, nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria. And because uh, large portions of the ocean are limited for nitrogen, that nitrogen that they produce ends up being very important for primary productivity. And so what, what are some of the questions we want to answer? How do they succeed in the oligotrophic, very low nutrient ocean? What molecular mechanisms have they evolved to succeed? And, uh, use those data in collaboration with uh, modelers to predict what will happen in the future. We see a lot of potential in macroalgae as a source of biofuel and very recently we've been pushing to uh, create collaborations with people in industry, people in government and so a really good example is the one that we have with Marine Bioenergy. They're based here locally in Pasadena and what they're working on is a kelp biofuel project that could potentially transform the energy landscape. What we're doing in the next two years uh, through funding from the Department of Energy is testing out a concept that would enable large-scale open ocean farming of kelp. And part of that strategy is depth cycling. Marine Bioenergy's idea is to take the kelp and bathe them in nutrient-rich water in the deep and then bring them back up to the light where they can photosynthesize and build more biomass. And so there's some evidence that kelp are able to absorb nutrients and use at a later time. Um, part of the next two years will be to investigate that potential. Aquaponics is a marriage of hydroponics, which is the liquid growth of plants, and aquaculture, which is the rearing of fish. And the idea of aquaponics simply put is it's a semi-closed system that is more sustainable than traditional gardening techniques. What surprised me about aquaponics is, is how little we know about the micro microbiology taking place in those systems. And so from a research standpoint, understanding where and when the two steps versus one step organisms are present are, is incredibly relevant to plant productivity and since the whole reason you're doing aquaponics is for food. Um, this is really relevant, uh, I think, research. We have a project involving a, an insect that will dispose of food waste. And when it disposes of the food waste, we end up with fertilizer, we end up with more fresh water, and we end up with food for fish and chickens. 
We have the fly house uh, loaded with flies mating and laying eggs. We hatch the eggs into very minute small larvae and as the larvae grow up we start feeding them uh, the food waste material. And it's important to note they produce no methane, one of the huge problems with most food waste. Now the food waste material is converted into larval biomass, uh, kilograms of larvae, and we take these larvae, dry them down, grind them up into a protein powder. And this protein powder can now be mixed with various ingredients to make food for chickens or fish. And many of the larvae, about 10% of them, are used to form pupae. And these pupae will be moved back into the fly house to become adult flies again and start the cycle. This is a, a kind of research very exciting to everybody. And when it works, it could change the world a little bit.